Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the message today is the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 1. Hear these words again. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Dear friends, in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I wonder, I wonder what was going through Joseph's mind before God came to the rescue. He was in a predicament. He was in a quandary. He was in a mess. And actually, verse 19 tells us what he was thinking about. It says in verse 19, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, they were engaged, but we need to understand that in those days, an engagement was an illegally binding matter, and it was tantamount amount to marriage. And as far as to break it off, he had to go through a legal divorce, a legal separation. And as far as any human court was concerned, it seems that Joseph had grounds for that divorce because Mary was going to have a baby, and it certainly was not Joseph's baby. This is what he finally decided to do, to divorce. That's what he had in mind. But up to this point, we can only imagine what was going through his mind. Mary, how could you do such a thing to me? I thought you were committed to me alone. Mary, I thought I knew you, but I don't know what to believe about you anymore. And we can imagine that Joseph was completely heartbroken. He realized that it was all over. How could they go on at this point? And through all of this, though, it's pretty clear that Joseph still had love for Mary. He loved her that he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He could have charged her with adultery. He could have had this whole society condemn her. And even worse, he could have had her stoned on the streets for her sin. But he wasn't going to do that. He was going to break it all off. He was not going to charge her with adultery. He was not going to make any noise about it. He would just walk away. I don't know about you, but I've often wondered if there was any discussion between Mary and Joseph. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but it sure seems natural that Mary would have tried to explain this to Joseph. Joseph, God did this. Well, we don't know if they had that conversation. But we do know that if she did, it didn't make any difference. He was still determined. He had made up his mind. He was going to divorce her. And so as he considers his next step, God comes to the rescue. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded. He took her as his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and then he called his name Jesus. 
Yes, God comes to the rescue, and he came to the rescue here. He changed the course of events. And Joseph, a just man, a righteous man, a faithful man, he was, for all the right reasons, about to do the wrong thing. But God comes to the rescue. And he assured Joseph that Mary has been faithful, that this child that she's carrying was indeed a miraculous child, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but this baby was the promised Savior who's coming into the world. He came to save his people from their sins. And so God comes to the rescue. That's what I want you to ponder this morning. God comes to the rescue. In the very next story in Matthew, we see it again. God comes to the rescue. In Matthew chapter 2 is the story, of course, the familiar story, the epiphany story of the wise men who come in following the star, looking for the one who is born king of the Jews. They go to Herod's palace and they inquire there. Herod is upset. He's threatened. And he asks the scribes, where is the Christ to be born? And they pointed out the prophecy in Micah that in Bethlehem. And so Herod directed them toward Bethlehem. And he asked them that when you find the child, come and give me word so that I too can worship him. We know he was lying. We know what he wanted. He wanted to destroy the child. And so after the wise men had met the child and gave, gave their gifts, they were warned to go home a different way and not go back to Herod. And then we hear these words. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose, Joseph rose, and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. Yes, God comes to the rescue. What other examples come to your mind as you think of the scriptures where God came to the rescue? Over and over again he has. What examples come to your mind? Well, for me, I think about when the children of Israel are rescued out of Egypt after finally after the tenth plague and they are on the way to the promised land. They encamp by the Red Sea and behind them is Pharaoh and his army. He had changed his mind once again. They, they came to destroy the children of Israel. And they were in a dilemma. The Red Sea on the one side, and behind them was Pharaoh and his army to bring murder to them. And what would they do? God comes to the rescue. We can see it in our mind's eye, can't we? Where God told Moses to hold his staff over the, over the sea. And as he did that, God opened up the waters. And they went through on dry ground. And they were rescued. Or maybe you think about the children of Israel as they were in this quandary against the Philistines and there was no one to stand forth and be their champion because they had Goliath on their side and everyone was afraid. And God rescued his people with that servant child, that teenage boy, David, who went in and, and fought Goliath and won. What do you think about? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or Daniel in the lion's den. Or maybe you think of Cyrus the king that God had used. Even though Cyrus never even knew the Lord, God used Cyrus to deliver his children out of the Babylonian captivity. Or maybe that you think of how God rescued his infant church from that horrendous persecutor Saul and changed Saul into a great champion of the faith by the Lord's blessing and grace. Or you think of Peter who came out of prison and the chains fell off, the doors opened automatically by God's power in chapter 11 or chapter 12 of Acts or chapter 16 of Acts where we have Saul and, or have, we actually have Paul and Silas being delivered and rescued from the prison cell that they were in. So there's lots of examples, aren't there? And maybe you think of other ones too. I want you to ponder that though, that God comes to the rescue. And even in our lives, God has come to the rescue. You were in a predicament. You had a problem. You had some difficulty. There was a mess, and you didn't know what to do about it. But God came to the rescue, and you look back and you say, yes, he did. It might have been when you, your vehicle broke down, 
I got a couple of examples of that in my life. The, the vehicle broke down in, a, in the middle of nowhere, and God came to the rescue through people, and we got back on the road within a few hours that we would have should have been there for a few weeks. God comes to the rescue for us in those kinds of ways. Maybe you had a diagnosis or an operation, and it looked grim, and there was not a lot of hope the doctors were giving, but God came to the rescue. It happened to, to my father when he had cancer years ago. And after he was cancer-free, the doctor said, Don, we only figured you had 10% chance to live, and look at you now. God comes to the rescue. Injury, illness. Maybe he did not allow a certain deal to go through. Maybe you were going to buy a house or you're going to invest or something and for whatever circumstance it was, God did not allow it to happen. And what he was doing was coming to your rescue because you know, you look back at that and you say, thank God I didn't buy it. Thank God it didn't come through. I would have lost a lot. He comes to the rescue for us. Maybe you were on the edge of despair and you thought that all hope was gone. But he came to the rescue for you, and he put just the right people in your path to help you at just the right time. Today is the birthday of one of several of our members, actually. Uh, we have a large congregation, so when you look at the birth dates, you might have several people. We do today, again. It's pretty common. Well, today there's one individual particularly who just turns nine today. His name is Micah Bowl. I remember the day he was born. I got a phone call from his dad. He said, we have a, a new baby boy. It's a wonderful blessing. But pastor, could you come to the hospital because he has cancer? And so I went to the hospital, and the first thing that we did is baptize Micah because we didn't know what was going to happen. The next day, he was flown down to Denver, spent the first two, three months of his life down there in Children's Hospital. And he had been receiving blessings after blessing of medical care. But God came to the rescue for him. Just recently, he had his, his yearly checkup, and they said, you don't have to come for a while. You're looking great. God comes to the rescue. You know, that's why Jesus was born. That's why we celebrate Christmas because God came to the rescue for us as he always does but here at Christmas we celebrate his coming into the world to rescue us from our greatest enemy our enemy of sin and that enemy of sin brings forth death and brings forth judgment against us but God came to the rescue that's why the angel told Joseph she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You know, today I need to remind you also that there was a time when God didn't come to the rescue, and that was important that he didn't. I take you back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was with his disciples that Thursday night. And they were waiting and praying. Well, at least Jesus was. The rest of them were sleeping and they were upset. And Jesus was praying. And then Jesus' enemies came, led by Judas, the betrayer. And as the soldiers came into the garden with their torches and lanterns, lanterns and weapons, Peter asked Jesus, shall we take our swords and shall we fight in defense of you? And Jesus says, put your swords away. Do you not know that I could call upon my Father at this very moment and he would send more than 12 legions of angels to deliver? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? And so the rescue did not come for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he was led away, he was tortured, he was nailed to a cross. And that was all part of God's amazing plan of salvation for us, to rescue us from our sins. Although the people, they jeered at Jesus and they, they put it in his face that you saved others, you can't even save yourself. 
If you say that you are the Son of God, then why, not, why won't the Father come and save you and rescue, from, rescue you from this cross? But no rescue came. And that's because our rescue was most important. And then Jesus cried out in those mysterious, amazingly strange words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we hear those words and we understand by faith what was happening. The father did not rescue his son. He condemned his son. He judged his son. He gave his son the full punishment of hell so that we would not receive what we deserve. So that we would be rescued. And that's what he did. Because Jesus was not rescued from the horror of the cross or the judgment of hell, we have been rescued from the horror of death and, and, and hell. God comes to the rescue. I want you to think about that in these days around Christmas. I want you to think about that as you live your life in faith. When you're in a dilemma, when you're in a pickle, when you're in some kind of a mess, don't be afraid. God has come to the rescue, and he will deliver you according to his will, and it will be a blessing for you. May God strengthen your faith in our rescuing Savior, God with us, Jesus, our Savior from sin. May God bless us richly in his name. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.